Hello, I'm Kevin Siepel. I'm the President and Dean of Ave Maria School of Law, and I have two very special guests with us today. To my left is Miss Polly Cruz. She's a native Floridian from Tampa, as I understand. That's right. And she's also a gold star mother. Her son, Sergeant Robert, everyone called him Bob Cruz, was killed in Vietnam May 22, 1968. He was serving with the 1st Squadron, 9th Cavalry, 1st Cavalry Division. And to Polly's left is Mr. Ken, Kenneth Pollard, Ken Pollard. And Ken was actually serving in the same unit as Polly's son, Bob was in, in Vietnam. And Ken actually wrote a book about his experiences in Vietnam and two chapters he de designated, um, or dedicated, excuse me, uh, to Sergeant Bob Cruz. Let me start off by uh, just explaining how we met, Polly. We met at uh, a uh, Wounded Warriors Project event where the Wounded Warriors, Dale Mullen, the president of the Collier County mm -hmm. Wounded Warriors, dedicated a plaque to Bob Cruz to be placed on our wall of honor here in the Veterans Memorial Law Library. And I will have to say that it, I feel like it's a blessing that uh, he introduced us to you, and we feel honored to have your son's plaque on the wall. Thank you. I feel honored as well. And before we get into uh, talking about your son, I thought uh, we could talk just shortly about your husband. Your husband was also a veteran. Yes. Pliny, mm -hmm. and he served in World War II. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your husband? Well. Um, He was sent to Newfoundland because they needed a clerk typist at headquarters. And fortunately, he did not go to battle. Um, he spent two years at what they call the Battle of the Rock, which was an outpost for enemy submarines. There was a Navy base, an air base, and an Army base. And I am so thankful that he had taken typing in high school because that's how he managed to stay out of combat. Very good. And you are a gold star mother, uh, of course, because of your son's death, but I would like to talk a little bit about what it means to be a gold star mother. Uh, it's my understanding that it was a national service organization that was um, organized after World War I in 1928. Exactly. And it's to honor mothers that have lost children in war and also to honor the mothers themselves. Is that correct? Um, yes, and I, it is the 90th anniversary of Gold Star Mothers this year. And um, I feel um, so proud now that it isn't just mothers who are being honored. It's fathers and family members as well. And um, it took quite a while to have it included that it would be family rather than just mothers because it's a loss to more than just mothers. Um, we now have available, by the way, um, license plates that are for Gold Star families. And that just happened last year because you could get license plates for uh, Gold Star Mothers, but now you can get them for Gold Star Families as well. And part of your mission <clears throat> was to bring Gold Star Mothers to Southwest Florida, is that right? That's right, and um, of course, it's the 50th anniversary of my son's death, but um, years ago, uh, there were just not enough Gold Star Mothers in our county. And we tried to organize a tri-county Gold Star Mothers chapter, but that didn't happen either. And then, unfortunately, I became ill and um, was out of commission for a little while, so um, we had to put it on hold. But March last year, we uh, managed to get a chapter chartered, and it includes Southwest Florida. Um, at one time, we only had um, one chapter on the South Coast, and that was from Pensacola to um, Marco Island. And now, we have the Southwest chapter, and um, 
it's growing and we're able to do great things. We raise money for um, veterans, for um, veterans' families who are in need, and for um, the Fisher House in Tampa, which is for families of uh, brain injured veterans whose families live all over the United States. And if I may say so, it's like a Ronald McDonald house. And um, so we're very proud to be able to support that. Well, that is very impressive, Polly, and congratulations on starting that here in Southwest Florida. Do you know who the oldest uh, living Gold Star mother is in Southwest Florida? I'm the oldest living Gold Star mother in the state of Florida. <laughs> well, that's, I feel that's very cool. blessed. Um, I sometimes wonder what God would like have me to do. And um, I am a fundraiser for Gold Star Mothers. Wow. Thanks to Kenneth Pollard who <laughs> wrote the book, um, Through My Eyes, Vietnam, 1968. And um, he's donated many copies of that book to raise funds for Gold Star Mothers. Um, it's been my pleasure to finally meet Kenneth because he knew my son the last three months of his life and they became very good friends. Yes, we did. Good talk and about I that. And I love him dearly. <laughs> <laughs> well, you met Kenneth in 1969, right after Kenneth came back from Vietnam, is that right? Yes, very briefly. Okay. Um, I don't think Kenneth minds me saying that um, he had a lot to overcome when he came back from Vietnam, yeah. as most veterans do have a problem, um, understandably. Sure. I just couldn't open up to them. When they came back, it was still too fresh in my mind. And so uh, I apologize since for not being able to, you know, tell them more about what went on and about Bob. But uh, finally had a chance to do that. And that's recently when you came out with your book, you actually met back up with Polly, is that right? Yes. I wrote the book and uh, I wasn't sure if they were still in Naples or how many of the family was living. And so I just, my daughter, she's good at social media, so she got on Facebook, which I wasn't on. And uh, she contacted uh, everybody she could. And we finally got in touch with Linda. Polly's Ms. daughter. Polly's Linda. daughter. And uh, that's how we'd, she put in a request for Marilyn, her uh, daughter in Tallahassee. And her Polly son, we was just trying to find anybody that had any contact. Okay. And I finally got a hold of Linda there at the bank here in Naples. Oh, very good. And it started from there. Let's talk a little bit about Bob, uh, Polly. Uh, obviously, Bob was a very patriotic individual and loved his country. Can you tell us a little bit about his patriotism and how it is that he came about going to Vietnam? and a little bit about who he was as a person. Well, he, um, he was patriotic, and um, fortunately he was in Germany for almost two years. And um, when his um, time came up that it, he had one year left, uh, his officer came to him and he was a clerk at headquarters. And his officer came to him, and I'm sure they always say, I'm sorry, but to lose you, but you have to serve in Vietnam. So uh, Bob didn't let us know he was coming home on leave, but he came, he got a hop to, from, uh, he wanted to fly over the Everglades. He had hunted in the Everglades, but he hadn't flown over the Everglades. So he got a flight from Miami. And when he came in the door, he dropped his duffel bag and said, 
I don't want to talk about it, but when I leave, I'll be going to Vietnam. And of course, his dad said, no, Bob, you're our only son, and you're not going to Vietnam. And he said, yes, Dad, you went in World War II. Uncle Bob went to Korea, and I'd rather go to Vietnam than have my married friends with children go. And uh, Bob was very patriotic. He was a faithful Christian, um, had a wonderful singing voice, and sang in church. Um, I understand, that, Ken, maybe you know about this, that uh, on Sunday when uh, he would uh, come in from a mission, he would go and find the chaplain and have communion. He wouldn't miss. So, um, yeah, very proud of him, of course, as I am our two daughters as well. And um, he was patriotic, and he, he really never caused us any problems as a teenager. Um, what can I say? Our only son, we dearly loved him. We still miss him but um, it is a, up to us. It was life, and we have to accept it the way it's handed to us. And one way to overcome grief is to help others. Now, Ken, um, as I said earlier, you were actually in the same unit as, as Bob. You were a crew chief in Vietnam right. on uh, Cobra helicopters and then uh, Huey gunships. and. And Bob actually came after you had been in the unit for a little bit. He came and he was from Florida, you were from Florida. And so can you tell us a little bit about your relationship with Bob? Well, I was uh, working on some mini guns on a helicopter on a flight line and somebody came and told me that there's a guy from Florida that I wanna know if I'd met him and I said, no, I haven't seen him. And so, that evening, I was going to guard duty, and the uh, the guy that was with me looked over and said, "Here comes that the boy from Florida," and it seemed like I already knew him. I don't know; it's just a thing we had. Both of us was so easy to talk to. We started talking and talked about our families and where we lived and what we was interested in hunting and things like that. Then he had to go to a briefing for the next day's meeting. But as soon as he got out of the briefing, he came back out to the guard bunker on, on the line out there. And um, we got to talking after that. And it was, we both started talking about our hunting trips and come to find out that, that his camp was right by our camp. We had to pass it every time we went there. Every year we went down to the, back in there where Ave Marie is now. And uh, we stayed in there. Sometimes some of us stayed uh, a week and some two weeks. Well, we never met, but we knew the area and talked about hunting a lot in the area. And I got to talking to him about a young lady and her family had lived in Naples and moved up to, um, to manage a horse farm it was called Elkham Farms. Found out later it was Michael Brothers that, that owned Elkham Farms. Well, they came up and lived on the, the farm there raising the horses, race horses. And I told him who her name was and he knew her and her family right away. So that kind of put us a little closer together there knowing someone and so close to Lake Placid and Naples. and. We had planned to meet up after we got back, and which never happened. And Take us back to May 22nd, 1968, and if you could tell the viewers of this film um, what Bob was doing on the mission that he was on, and, uh, and just tell us a little bit about what happened. Well, the, the day before, they had a, we had a helicopter crash, was shot down in the mountains just outside of Camp Evans. And uh, 
everyone in it. We suppose the best uh, intelligence reports we got that they were all deceased. And so it was up to us and Bob team to go in and retrieve the bodies to bring them back, sent home. Well, the night before he came over and we talked quite a bit and I'd told him time after time, because he always told me that he would walk point and carry the radio. And I used to give him a hard time because I told him, Bob, you're the platoon sergeant. You, sh you have a man trained to walk point. It's too dangerous for you up there. And plus, carry the radio. You should have a radio man, and you should be controlling everything from the back. But he was that type. He, he cared about the men that he was with, and he didn't want to put anybody in harm's way. And he told me that he'd rather do it than make somebody else do it. And that's just the way he was, and which eventually got him in trouble. But he wouldn't have had it no other way. He, he felt like he could control better if he knew it was up, he was up front and he could tell what was going on. And, but that's just the kind of guy he was, a very selfish guy. And so on the day of uh, the mission when they flew in, uh, Bob was infantry and they were uh, putting his platoon in there to re recover the body. So he was actually on the ground to go retrieve the bodies of a crew that went down the night the day before. Uh, what happened? Well, we started prepping the scene, or they did. I, he came over and asked me if I was gonna cover for him that day, and I, my helicopter was down waiting on some parts to come up from down south. And I told him I couldn't do it, but uh, I said, the, my pilot is gonna take over another flight, and he's gonna go in, and he's real good. And um, so, <clears throat> After they, he came over and told me that night he, he had a funny feeling that they shouldn't go up there it's because they'd went in the day before and got shot up and, and they couldn't do anything so they pulled back out. But he'd already talked to the commander and I suggested he do, did that to, to talk to him. And uh, the squadron commander ordered it for us to go back in there. So they, the first helicopter started receiving gunfire when they first went in. That was the first attempt, and then they had to pull back. Bob was on the second helicopter. Well, then later on, they went back in there, and then when the Cobras went in and started spraying the area, they started receiving fire, but they couldn't tell where it was coming from. So they tried another attempt to put the troops in, so Bob and them went in. He was on the first chopper that time, and then the other choppers came in. They never got fired on, but they put them in, and the helicopters pulled back out. So they were working their way up a clearing path that they, they had, and that's when it all happened at that point. You were actually uh, back at the base camp, Evans, listening on the radio. Is yeah, that I had checked out a radio at Supply, and I had the radio, and I was out there on the bunker. In fact, it was so close, I could see the helicopters, and one circling around, I could hear every radio conversation that was going on. So it was, I felt like I was pretty much into it at that point, but, uh, that's about it. I don't say any more about it. it. It's pretty hard to do. And and you came to find out that he was on the on the point. Uh, yes, yeah, when when I heard the radio conversation calling back in, I knew that wasn't him, and I thought, well, he took my advice and let the radio operator carry the radio and RTO or whatever they called him and. But then after it was all over, they started receiving heavy automatic weapons fire and they called in the commander. And, and then that's when I knew his call sign was 27. And then that's when the guy first came on and said that he had, the commander asked him how many 
KIAs and WIAs, and and the first thing he said is two seven didn't make it. And now you mentioned that both of you talked about how dangerous it was going to be, um, but you also talked to each other that if you all were part of that crew that was out there um, and had been killed, that you would want other people to go in to, to yeah, get you, is that right? Correct. I uh, talked to him the night before and, and we talked about going in and, and I said, you know, surely there's something that we can do to keep y'all from having to go in there. And he said, well, they, they, they give us orders and they want to go in and get those bodies out of there where they could send them home to their, their families. And then Bob told me, he said, well, I, if I was out there, I'd want somebody to come get me and not leave me out there. And so it went from there. And we did, they did, they got them out. Luckily, they got the four out of the helicopter that had been down that Bob and them was going after. And they also got Bob and the other soldiers that was wounded and killed. They got them all out at the same time. Would you know, Ken, um, one time Bob, he didn't write things to us that would alarm us, mm -hmm. but he would write it to his friends. And uh, one time, uh, one of the quotes that we received was that um, there were so many bodies on one of the helicopters that they were bringing out that they couldn't lift off the ground with the crew. And the crew had to wait until the helicopter was lifted. And then they had to hang on to get back yeah, to that's, where that's, they were going. That happened. But um, there's also something, Ken, that you mentioned, and uh, that if anything went wrong in Vietnam, it did. Yeah. And one thing that I would like to stress is that our government stopped sending our young boys and girls into harm's way without proper safety equipment and all the help they need to not only save their lives, but others. Well, I wanna say on behalf of our school and our community, thank you very much to both of you uh, for the sacrifices you've made for our country. And it's, it's my honor to be associated with the two of you and to meet you and to hear, the, hear your story about your son and to read about your story in Vietnam as well, Kim. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.